Christ yes. in us, that we have his thoughts, that we see it his way, not our way. Yes. So let's get Judy with it and get into it here. <laughs> this is our scripture of the week. Amos 3.3. 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? No. This is this this verse right here is far bigger than the little few words that's up there. If uh, if me and Jim go outside and I say, Jim, I'm gonna go north. Let's walk. He says, Well, I'm gonna walk, but I'm gonna go south. Can we walk together? No, no because we're not agreed on it. No, I didn't say talk, I said walk. Nah. It's confusing, I know. But if we both go outside and say, I'm going to go north, and he says, I'm going to go north too. We're in agreement, and we can walk together north. Nothing happens without agreement. You can go to Silverthorns, Look at a brand new car and go, I love this car. And the salesman says, well, here's the price we're asking for. After you pick yourself up off the ground, yeah. you say, <laughs> I ain't paying that. And he says, well, let's go in and figure out some stuff. And you get the paper and the pens and the calculators and you wheeling and dealing. And finally, at the end of it, you come into an agreement on a price and you drive off with a new car. But if you cannot come into agreement mm -hmm. on that price, mm -hmm. that new car will sit there until somebody does. Yeah. Yeah. When you got married, for those who are married, those who want to be married, those who should be married, <laughs> <laughs> and you went to your spouse and said, Will you? And they said, no, no. <laughs> you didn't get married. But if they said, will you? And they said, I will. Then the two become one. Wow. Nothing happens in heaven that there's not agreement on. Wow. And I'll tell you something else. Nothing happens in the kingdom of Satan that there's not agreement on. Wow. Because you can believe and, and, and agree with what God says. And then turn right around and agree with what the devil says. Mm -hmm. There is a positive and negative to agreement. Again, I say unto you, if, if you agree on anything, if two of you agree on anything on earth about anything, it'll be done for you by my Father in heaven. Wow. Now think about that. If me and Peg, we come into an agreement, and I find a promise in his word of truth. And I say, here's what it says, pumpkin, that's what I call her, pumpkin. I say, here's what it says right here, look. And she looks at it and goes, yeah, I gotta say that. I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. And we pray on that, and we agree on that. Jesus said, It'll be done. Hallelujah. This is how powerful agreement is. Let's look at some more just for a second here. Come on. Eve in the garden being confronted by the serpent, Satan. And here's what he said to him, to her. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good from evil. And when the woman saw the tree, that it was good for food, 
and that it was pleasant to the eye and a tree desired to make one wise, she took and ate the fruit. God said, do not eat of that fruit. The day you eat of that fruit, you'll die. Satan comes up and says, you're not going to die. There's the lie. There's the deception. You're not going to die. Why? God knows the day you eat of that, you're going to be like him. You're going to be wise. And she looks at it and she starts agreeing with the words Satan said. And she acted on that agreement. And all this mess that we have in the world today came from that. And you say, yeah, but Richard, she didn't die immediately. Yes, she did. She was kicked out of the garden. And that is separation from God is spiritual death. She died right then. They died right then. He ate too. And they died right then. Now, they physically died later. Death did enter into this world. That's a bad agreement. Here, Ananias and Sapphira show up at Peter's revival. And Ananias, I think it was Ananias first. Yeah. The Ananias came in and said, here's the money. We sold the property and here's all the money we're giving to God. Boom, fell over dead. People hauled him off and buried him. His wife comes in. Now listen to this. And Peter answered unto her, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, yay, for so, yeah, we did. We sold it for that price. But she kept, see, they kept part of it for herself. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried your husband are at the door and they're going to carry you out too. Mm. Boom. Bad agreement. Wow. Bad agreement. But this is a good agreement. Ephesians 1.13, if you've been in the Monday night meditation of the word, we've already been through this one right here. In whom ye also trusted after ye have heard the word of truth. Heard the word of truth. You need to remember that. The gospel of your salvation in whom also after ye have believed. They heard the truth and they agreed on it. They heard the word and they agreed on it and were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. This is how we're saved. You hear the word of truth. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of words out there, but they're not all true. Let me say that again. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of words out there, but they're not all true. Okay. <laughs> Romans 10, 9, that if you'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believed unto righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses and he has salvation. This is how you're saved. You preach the word of truth to somebody, they either agree with it or they don't. If they come into agreement with that, they believe in their heart and they say, yes, I believe that. I believe Jesus was born a virgin. I believe he walked this earth without sin. I believe that he gave his life on that cross. I believe he was buried and I believe three days later he rose from the grave and seated at the right hand of the Father. He is saved. That's how simple salvation is. Becoming a disciple is a little harder. Salvation is easy. Matthew 6 31 says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? 
What are we going? What are we going to have for supper? What are we going to eat? You know, things are getting terrible in this world. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? We've got to have clothes. We've got to have shelter. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. And this right here is what we're going to be talking about. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? The ones he just mentioned right up here. Shall be added unto you. Sure. Seek ye first God's kingdom. You get saved. You get into his kingdom. And he says he will take care of you. Now I'm going to, I'm going to say something here. The Antichrist does not control in fear of nuclear war. When the Antichrist shows up, he's going to control people with fear that they can't buy or sell. You have to have that little dumb mark or his name or his number or you can't buy or sell. Well, we can't, we're not going to be able to get food. What about how we're going to be able to get? I wonder why God put that in there. Don't worry about what you eat or what you're going to drink or the clothes on your back. Stop worrying. Amen. Cares and worries are deadly to a Christian. Read the parable of the sower. So we came and planted the seed, the word of God. There, everybody in here ought to have the word of God in there, real briefly, real briefly, that the word of God was placed in you. It's a, in a seed form, and it's growing in your garden called the heart. And if there's thorns and thistles in there, Jesus taught, not Richard, Jesus teaching, is that the thorns and thistles will choke out that seed and it will not produce fruit. And then he says what those thorns and thistles were. They're cares and worries. Yes. That cares and worries, if cares and worries occupy the same heart, it will choke out the word of God and make it of no effect. Jesus taught that. Read the parable of the sower. But we that are in the kingdom, we shouldn't have to worry because we know our Heavenly Father who owns all the gold, all the silver, all the cattle on a thousand hills will make sure that we have all that we need. Yes. You know, how many of you with kids, and if you don't have kids, you may not understand this, but how many of you with kids, if, if little Bobby comes home from school and says, I'm hungry. Did you get an A on your test today? Have you done enough work? Have you done enough of this? Have you cleaned your room? Have you done all that? And you don't get nothing until it's all done. Then you can eat. Or do they say, as a parent, Okay, let's go ahead and eat now, and we'll get our chores done later. How many A's do you have to have on your report card? How many A's does little Bobby have to have on his report card before you love him? Exactly. And that's our Heavenly Father. Stop thinking that God is mad at you, that God only gives when you do enough work. He said, I'll give, he's given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. All things. That's in the kingdom. Everything you need for life and godliness is in the kingdom. Well, why don't I have it? Well, we'll get to that, but let's just Play with that for a minute. Here's where I think the church is. When I say the church, I'm talking about the world church. The man, the father, had a sick daughter, comes up to Jesus and says, 
Lord, heal my daughter. And Jesus looks at him and says, do you believe I can do this? And he says, yes, Lord, I believe. But help my unbelief. Yes. I believe this is where the church is. We, every single one of us know God can do it. Yes. But. I know God can do all things. I'm just not sure he would do it for me. You're not coming into agreement with what his word says. He said, I will supply all of your needs. See, this agreement is super important. And for us to be living in prosperity, and we all think that's money. It's not. A person in, in prison can live in prosperity and not have a dime on the books. That's right. It's not about money. Money can be part of it, but it's not all about money. I don't want to go through these. I just want you to look how many times they say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The time is fulfilled that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe. Repent. Change your mind. Change the way you're thinking. And believe the gospel. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And as ye go preaching, say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in Luke 17, he says this, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the king, they want to know, when's the kingdom coming? We know you're, the, the king's going to come, he's going to rule. When's that kingdom coming? Jesus And he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. In other words, you don't see it sitting over there. You don't find it down there in the coffee shop. It's not hanging on the wall over here. Or they don't have a little booth out here along the street saying the kingdom of God. Neither shall, and just what I said, neither shall you say, Lo, well, it's here or it's over there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Yes. What if the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, whichever one you want to call it, that Jesus taught was not just a place we go when we die, but it is here now, right now, and accessible to each one of us. Now, let, me, let me just say something kind of off the wall a little bit. But that's me. Off the wall. For the first time in many, 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 many years, the United States has now acknowledged UFOs, saying there is UFOs. Wow. Took them long enough. We're the only country that has not acknowledged it until I think this year or last year. Over and over and over again, they have found spotted UFOs on radar. They send fighter jets up at them. The fighter jets are up there. They see it on their radar scope and they look out their little window with their own little eyes, and they see this thing out here traveling over 900 miles an hour and makes a right-hand turn. Boom, boom. 
That's physically impossible for us to do. Physically impossible for us to do that. We have no technology that would even come close to that. And not only while this thing is traveling 900 miles an hour and our jets can't keep up with it, they backtrack and come back at the jets and all of a sudden they're looking at it and it disappears. Boop. It's gone off the radar. It's gone off the radar on the ground and they lose sight of it. Again, physically impossible. I believe in UFOs. I do not believe in aliens. I believe in demons. Come on. This is a demonic activity and it is becoming more and more active. So when they disappeared, where did they go? Well, let me ask you something. Are there any angels in this room right now? Absolutely. Do you see them? Yes. I'm standing right here. <laughs> <laughs> but there's angels in here and we don't see them because they're in a different realm they hold a different space than we occupy same thing with those ufos and i believe the ufos are going to play a very major role in the end times a very deceptive role in the end times they're more and more frequent. Now then, the U.S. government says, yep, they're out there. Well, okay. What are they? Well, whatever it is, it's demonic, I guarantee you. It's not some alien from Mars that has populated the Earth with a germ millions of years ago, and we're offspring of that. And I have a feeling that will be a big, big issue coming up. But my point is this, there is a realm right here in this room where angels are and yet we can't see them, but they can manifest. Mm -hmm. They can manifest and show themselves. Mm -hmm. And this is like the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here. It has always been here. And we have access to it now. We need to learn to tie in, to agree with what this word says, change the way we think of what is possible and what's not possible, and start operating out of that kingdom. Because this is where prosperity is. And let me go on. Let me go on. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus didn't come just to get us to heaven. Jesus came to give us life, eternal life, and abundant life right now. And we have access to that life. We have access to that life. A life where we don't have to worry about and should not worry about bills, about what the doctor says, about tomorrow, about the nightly news. But we can rejoice in the fact that we have all things right now. Hallelujah. Now see, I'm not, I, I don't have to wait for eternal life. I have eternal life right now. I am seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I am there spiritually. I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. This is all new. 2 Peter 2.24 says that by the stripes of Jesus, we have been healed. Hallelujah. It has been done. It's past tense. Now then, let's appropriate it from the kingdom because it's all there. Hallelujah. It's all there. Everything in the kingdom is yours. You have it in everything Jesus has, you have. We are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Joy, happiness, health, prosperity, peace, love, power, authority, life, and all of it in abundance. Our Father does not run out. It's not like, well, i got to start uh, 
rationing out the healing here because there's been a run on healing and I'm just about out of that. There is no end. There is no end. What can stop us from receiving? For I believe in a lie. How does that happen? Probably false teaching. There's false teaching. You know, there's false teaching on pros uh, prosperity. There is. There's false teaching on grace, but I still want it. There's false teaching on the Holy Spirit, but I still need him. There's false teaching on heaven, but I still plan on going. But we believe a lie. This is why we need to know and be able to discern the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved. A workman. To rightly divide the word of truth. That we know what the truth is. So when the lie shows up, uh-uh, I, I ain't buying into that. I'm not going to agree with that. I agree with this. And every one of these we can talk about for an hour. So you think about them through the week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Superstition. This is, a, this is a fun one. How about these? Tarot cards. Ooh, tarot cards. Are these evil? Paper. No. No, they're not. It's ink on paper. It's ink on paper. There is nothing evil by itself. But yet, if I took all these and I put them together and made a big frame and hung them in my office, somebody would have a fit that there's demons hanging on that. Well, guess what? There's probably a demon sitting next to you. Don't no. look at anybody. <laughs> but there's demons in here. This doesn't hold demons. This is just a stupid card. What people do with these cards is evil. Yeah. It's what you do with them that makes this evil. It doesn't make this evil. It makes what you do evil. These are tools. That's all they are. And they're stupid cards. <laughs> what about the old Ouija board? Ooh, we get the spirits moving now. <laughs> Is this evil? Mm. No. How you use it? Paper on cardboard. I mean, ink on cardboard. That's all it is. <laughs> what you do with it is evil. What you do with this. Trying to trying to contact the spirits and find out tomorrow. The Bible says don't do that. Yeah. That's you. Yeah. That comes from you, not from this board. Okay? That's superstitious. <laughs> this is a tool used to try to find the future. How about money? Mm -hmm. Is money evil? Yes. The love of money. No. The love of money is the root of all evil, but money is a tool. And I want you to remember this because that money can be used to win souls. This, not so much. I lost my widget. So sometimes there are little superstition things. Oh, that, <laughs> I gotta tell you a story. I had a lady in a car. We just left church, the lady's in a car with us. It was around Halloween. There's a skeleton sitting out in this guy's yard. She rolls down her window and she starts yelling, you go back to hell where you came from. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And she's just going nuts. And I said, did that came from hell? Yes, it's of the devil. I said, well, that's weird. You've got one of those in your body and God put it there. Now what are you going to do with it? 
<laughs> Never say another word. <laughs> See, it, it's this religious type superstition that takes us down a wrong path a lot. Tradition, oh my gosh. How many that's old like me have listened to the arguments of what worship music really is? Why, singing off the wall, that's of the devil. Having a drum, those people are going to go straight to hell worshiping like that. Why, it has to be these old songs that come back from the 1600s. And when the hymnal came out, that was bar music. You've got a piano playing, that's bar music. And all this razzmatazz because that's the way we've always done it. Dear Lord. Because of our traditions. In fact, it says that you make the word of God of no effect because of your tradition. Mm -hmm. Talking to the Pharisees, the religious, the religious people. Mm -hmm. This is the way we've always done it. Well, if you can't embrace the truth because that's the way we've always done it, then you've got a real problem. You're stuck on stupid. <laughs> well. How about your own bias or a misconception? A misconception can be, I know God can do it, but he won't do it. You don't understand. You don't know what I've done. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. Have you ever said that? <laughs> don't raise your hand. But we can sit there and go, I know God can but I'm not worthy to do that. God has given me this sickness to keep me humble. God doesn't want you in sickness any more than he wants you in poverty or adultery. Let me say that again. God doesn't want you... What was I saying? Yeah. God doesn't want you sick. Well, I couldn't. I started saying that. I thought God doesn't want us sick. But anyway, <laughs> God doesn't want you sick any more than He wants you in poverty or in adultery. Right. 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 Our Father owns it all, mm -hmm. and He wants you to have the kingdom. Mm -hmm. He wants to give it to you more than you want it. Sin. A constant, I'm not saying, you know, I walk over and I bump my head and I cuss. I don't. Alright. I'm talking about that sin that you don't talk about. Come on. That is repetitive, repetitive, and done and done. And you may be fighting it, fighting it, fighting it, and it's done and it's done and it's done. Have you ever prayed before I have I'll just let you know I have Lord I'll never do that again why and to and do it again I've done that but sin does not make you any less a child of God it doesn't remove you from the kingdom it doesn't take away all the callings, all the gifts, everything he promises you, it doesn't do it. It just makes you wormy and you start changing your thinking about yourself. Your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I want you to think about the prodigal son. The prodigal son says, Father, give me all my stuff. And he takes all of his stuff and he goes into a foreign land way over here that's not even Jewish and he spends it all and he, he parties hardy and he does whatever and he, he finally falls flat on his face and he's in a pig pen eating pig food. And he thinks, the servants at my dad's house have it better than I do. 
He's repenting. He's changing his thinking. And he goes back. And his dad sees him. Is he still a son? Yes. He's still a son. He's out of fellowship with his father. But he's still a son. And the, and the father grabs him and says, Yes. Here's the ring. Here's the shoes. Here's the robe. Kill the fatted calf. We're going to party tonight. You're always a child of God. Greed and self-centeredness. If all you want out of the kingdom is what you can get and, and heap upon yourself so you can have a big house, a big mansion, a big car, a big boat, a big golf club, big whatever turns you on, get that big thing, and sit back and go, look at me, I've got all this stuff. Well, that greed and self-centeredness will stop you from receiving. Mm -hmm. The attitude of your heart mm -hmm. is very important. Mm -hmm. It's all about the heart. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he, what? Gave. 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 And what did he give? His son. His son. The very nature and character of God is giving. He gave his son. Think about that. His only begotten son. He gave his son. And his son came down. But his son came down and gave his life that you can have not only abundant life, but eternal life. Hallelujah. That we can be restored back to the Father. God gave his son. The son gave his life. And they were in agreement. In fact, Jesus said, we are one. The very nature and character of God is giving. And you and me were created... In the image of God. We should be givers. But my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Wow, what a powerful thing. Yeah, look at that what it says. But my God shall supply all your needs. What's the verse in front of that? Well, let me put it this way. What's the next five verses in front of that? I'll show you what that hinges on. Maybe. Paul speaking says, I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphras, <laughs> there's a name for you, uh, the things which were sent from you an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all of your needs. What Paul's saying right there, he said, nobody, if you read that in the context, he said, no one gave to me, but you took up offerings. You sent Epaphras. You sent him with the money, the food and stuff, and you met my needs. And he says, because you have met my needs, my God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you give to the ministry, when you give to the church, when you give to a ministry out there, a missions, when you supply the needs of the ministry, then God will supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. By Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Understand. God wants you to be a giver. Yeah. Prosperity. Prosperity is hinged. On the fact. That we agree. And that we give. Cheerful. A cheerful giver. Boy that's. And that's very. And we'll talk about that. Now see next week. We're going to talk about money. 
Right now, I'm talking about love, joy, peace, happiness, the fruit of the Spirit. That's all prosperity. Yes. That's all about prosperity. He wants you happy. He wants you at peace. He wants you... I'll tell you something he doesn't care about, and that's your comfort. Thank you for the one amen. But he doesn't care about your comfort. But he wants you healthy, at peace. He wants you full of love, full of joy, full of giving. That's true prosperity. Have you ever went and talked to somebody the nine, the, the talk to the thousand people and everybody rejects you, but the one person that accepts it and sits there and weeps and cries and accepts Jesus and you walk away like you're walking on air. You feel so good inside. You didn't get one dime out of that man, but you are prosperous. You are prosperous. Prosperous is bigger than money. Give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. How many have ever heard this used at an offering? Yep. <laughs> All the time. You know what's in front of it? Well, let's just look. But love your enemies. Do good to them that lend and lend. Never uh, sparing. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall have sons of the most, and ye shall be sons of the most high, for he is kind toward the unthankful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your father is. See there, be merciful. He's telling you to give something. Be merciful, even as your father is merciful. And judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, ye shall not be condemned. Release and it shall be released. And then that verse, then that verse, give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give unto your bosom? For with what measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured again. How, how much forgiveness, how much mercy, yeah. how much love, how much, there's nothing there about money. Not one thing about money. But the more you give, he says it's going to be given back to you. If you forgive people, if you're a forgiving person, you'll be forgiven. If, if, you're, if you give mercy, you'll get mercy. If you show love and kindness, love and kindness is going to be given back to you. Does this work on money? Yes. Whatsoever you sow, you shall also reap works on money but the context is not money and I'm telling you today that prosperity out of the kingdom of God is not what we think it is at least not what they're preaching on TV no. but let me oh, we just did that Listen to this. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, so that he may have something to share with those in need. Amen. Do you see about giving, giving, giving? And it's all through the scriptures. Prosperity is more about abundance of the nature of God than it is money. Prosperity is when you have all your needs met to fulfill your calling and you've got more to help somebody else fulfill their calling. Amen. Remember, we're, we are building a kingdom. We are building a kingdom. In fact, it's not just about getting people saved. It's making disciples out of nations. Mm -hmm. That's what we're called to do. And next week, we'll do it again. Yeah. And we're going to look at it a different way. But what I want you to understand is that agreement with the word of truth is what saved you. And agreement with the word of truth 
is what's going to open the doors of prosperity and not just money. Understand prosperity is not just money. It's far bigger, far more, far more in depth than Jack. And our job being children of God is to be givers so that we can build this kingdom of God. You want to know what's, uh, I don't even want to start on that because I'll just go nuts. And I don't want to go nuts. Let's stand. Uh, is there any questions? You can turn that off now.